Hello everyone, welcome inside the Red Earth Production Studios for this edition of YBM Cast. Powered by Game 7 Baseball, Game7Baseball.com. Fall ball, if you got uh, some interest in it, go to Game7Baseball.com, register your team, check out uh, the fall events that they have going on there, and get your team uh, in there, get some reps in the fall. Um, weather's been nice, right? So pretty nice to play some fall ball. Not too hot out there, not sweating down as much. I mean, it's still pretty good for August, right? We're Yeah. I mean, nice. it's pretty nice weather. I like it. So, Game7Baseball.com. Um, also, if uh, you didn't catch it, I, I do want to uh, give our condolences to the Penning family. Uh, Dennis Penning ha passed away uh, the other day. Um, if you're interested, there'll be a celebration, celebration of life. Of life. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, at the Maryland Heights Community Center. Uh, we'll be there. Uh, you gonna head over, Coach? Gonna, gonna get try. the opportunity. Yeah. Um, heck of a nice man. Made a lot. Impacted the community a lot. I met him uh, way back uh, playing Super Series baseball mm -hmm. when they were running the Super Series tournaments. First one down in Kirkwood that we went to. So, um, anyway, uh, love you, Dave. Uh, to you and the family, our condolences, buddy. So let's move on here to some baseball. We got, uh, as always, the guru, Kevin Mulder, back by popular demand. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we just been running busy. I took a, I took a break. It was good. Uh, I feel refreshed. We, you know, not thinking too much about baseball, uh, doing other things, enjoyed some time off. But we're back now to talk some baseball. And uh, to my right, Coach Tony Perkins, uh, Francis Howell High School. Coach, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. Kevin, you're back from Columbia. How'd it go? Phenomenal. Had a, you hit on the weather. We've had a great day of weather uh, in Columbia, and we had uh, about 180 um, for the fall underclass games. And... Um, had a great workout and then four games um, going on out there. So a lot of good players and uh, a lot of fun, fun day. Very good. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about this. Um, some 2026, you, the rankings just come out. We're going to we're going to look at the rankings uh, from PBR. We're going to start with the sophomore class. up in 2019 and basically there was a void in the area I mean it, we saw that there was an opportunity to have a retail store where people could come in and actually touch and feel the tangible object that they're buying you 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 made mention to me and and I didn't even notice it, but as I was going through the uh, the the names uh, the other day, and then we're texting back and forth, and you said you had so many new kids out there uh, this time, and there was there was 63 total players at your event in Columbia as far as the 2026 class. So, oh no, excuse me. Yeah, isn't that right? Isn't that correct? Yeah, no, you're correct. Um, and 55 of those players that you had out there were not on the rankings. So the um, 
this happens every year with the young guys, and the, the rankings do not reflect anything that happens in the fall. So a kid that was at Sunday's event that had never been to an event is not in the rank. It will redo that um, at the end of fall ball, beginning of uh, you know November time frame. Um, but, yeah, that's the exciting thing about the young guys is uh, – you learn a lot uh, of new names and guys change. Coach knows this. You'll have a freshman that, uh, you know, looks one way as a freshman and is a completely different guy when he shows up the next year. Um, they might grow uh, four inches and gain 20 pounds or, you know, just kind of uh, mature physically or mentally. And guys change quick in a hurry. I'm, I'm always the first to say this, Coach. Um, you know, you do these rankings and all you got to do is wait a couple of weeks and you're going to be wrong because the, the kids <laughs> change so quick. You're right. <laughs> you're absolutely right. There's so many kids that, you know, they mature at different rates. You know, look at Mark Burley, who was, you know, five foot six when he was in high school. And by the time he's a freshman in college, he's a f freshman in uh, yeah, college at Jeffco. He's six, two, six, three. I mean, just bam, it just sprouts different times. You know, some of those guys that sprout earlier look great or your number one guy this year in your rankings. You know, a couple of years, he's going to get caught. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You go ahead, Kevin. No, I was going to say that it, it happens all the time. And, and it's a huge message for just kids and parents in general. Uh, run your own race like every there's going to be early developers. Um, the kids that seem like they're all Americans or whatnot when they're in seventh and eighth grade, there is no guarantee um, that that player will be a good uh, varsity high school baseball player, quite honestly. And, you know, oftentimes kids that are the best at the young age, um, you know, they, they have a target on their back and there's kids that are working extremely hard to catch them. Um, you know, and, and sometimes they end up going wire to wire. You, you get a prodigy and uh, they, they do end up being the best in the Little League, the best in middle school, the best in high school, and the best in college and the best in pro ball. Uh, but more often than not, that stuff changes and, and changes in a hurry, um, especially when we kind of get into that 8th, ninth, 10th, 11th grade years. That's I want to look at uh, this top 10 real quick. Because there's some kids uh, that, of course, we've not seen. Uh, at the top of this list is Cooper Shrum, uh, Belton High School. Where is Belton? Is that Kansas City? Yeah. It's an hour or so, or so outside of the Kansas City area. Okay. Uh, committed to Tennessee um, as a utility player. Um, it, it, he, now, he is a pitcher. Um, he is yeah. listed as a utility oh, okay. player because the at that age, we allow them to list their own position. So um, he will he will pitch at Tennessee. Um, now, he I'm sure he's he's a pretty good high school hitter. Um, but coach knows this, uh, you know, sometimes you get your hands on a guy and he does both for you. But you know, as a coach, hey, he's he's going to go there as a as a pitcher, or he's going to go there as a hitter. Um, you know, very rarely um, do guys move on to college as, as both. Sometimes they do, um, but Cooper's a, a lean, tall, projectable pitcher that's already in the upper 80s and um, has a world of upside. Coach, you've got uh, a young man four on the chart here Dylan Curtis he's listed as a right-handed pitcher here uh coming up this year as a sophomore um have you seen much of him did he play uh freshman or was he on JV squad last year he was on a JV team I got Dylan Curtis and Jake Brett Schneider both of them are pretty special dudes got high ceilings um they got a chance I know Jake touched uh 90 last weekend so um Dylan had a great summer just from twitter land i mean uh, <laughs> he didn't he didn't give up a lot of runs i don't know what kind of competition we're playing there but you know that's still you're getting people out and yeah both those guys will be with me at the varsity level as sophomores they're 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 loose they both you know work hard they both stay focused and they both compete and from what i've seen they throw strikes so good for us 
Good for us. Both yeah. tall too, right, Coach? Six, oh, yeah. six four and six yeah. five, respectively, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Brett's brother Jack is a could be a junior. He's six six. So they got two big donkeys there, and they're they're good kids, man. I love being around them. They're so it's a lot of fun for me. I'm Dang. pretty blessed. Does your basketball way. coach have his hands on these guys? Jake Jake played on the varsity basketball team last year as a freshman. I think he's given it up. Yeah, I think he's not going to oh, play wow. basketball. He's just going to focus on baseball. And he's become PO now. Like we were talking about that <laughs> with Jake and, and Dylan, the same way. He's a hitter too. He's a shortstop. Dylan is, but Jake, you know, yep. uh, he ended up being a PO, and I think he's kind of embraced that now. And I haven't really talked to Dylan too much about that, but we'll see how it goes. Wow, these are some decisions being made early in uh, in some of these guys high school careers um, yeah it, it's tough i mean like kevin was saying earlier about them kids that uh you know are two-way guys in high school and, mm-hmm. and and like us people have been around a little bit you know we like he was talking about number one there that you know he's a good high school guy but he's going to pitch at tennessee right so right. we know that yeah. we understand that but getting the the, the kid and the parents to deal with that they're so used to having their kids when like they're in seventh and eighth and ninth grade you know being a shortstop being the best pitcher batting third or fourth every day you know you know all summer all fall whatever else you know and that's a tough goal when you get up there and it's like you know we can't do that no more and and you're hitting hitting usually goes off to the wayside usually because you're concentrating so much on hit on hitting I mean on pitching so it, it's it, it's tough but uh more and more kids are embracing that. It, you know, la- last five or six years, I've noticed that, especially in my program, where kids have said, you know, I'm a PO. You know, it, at 10 years ago, not that many of those kids did that. I mean, they would just roll in and they wanted to hit and da da da. But not, nowadays, I mean, I'll, I'll have, I'll probably have six to eight POs, pitcher only guys, you know, on my high school team, which, Ten years ago, if I had one or two, I mean, that was something different. But that's wow. just how the, you know, landscape has changed a little bit, and far as our training goes. And so. and to to your point, Kevin, uh, it was it was two years ago. Um, we're watching Daniel Whistler play, and I'm talking about him hitting and whatnot, and his dad. And I've talked to him, you know, and he wanted to hit in college. And the, and Kevin didn't say this on the air. He would look at me, and go, "He's going to pitch." <laughs> he's he, he, he said and that's what summer. he said he's a good high school hitter brian but he'll be a pitcher well after the first week daniel daniel's dad texted me back and he was just you know it's just this the way it is and it goes to what you said after the first week daniel says i'm going to be a pitcher only it's too much you got school you got all this and like you said and you know <laughs> and kevin smile you guys know these things. It's just the nature of it, correct? Yeah, and Daniel was a heck of a high school hitter. I mean, he was a good player, and uh, but there's just a difference. Um, and it gets extremely hard to do both at, at the collegiate level just because it's so time that, that you only have so much time. It's physically demanding. Uh, there's different training involved. So it, it, it becomes extremely, extremely difficult. Um, I know coach probably gets put in, in tough positions. Sometimes we're talking about these young guys um, and, and he's been blessed with plenty of them. Uh, (laughs) You probably get in a a tough spot where you have a freshman or sophomore you like, where you need him to help you on, or, or he can help you on the varsity level as a pitcher, but he's good enough to hit but only at the freshman or sophomore level. But then when he gets to the varsity level, it's like, hey, buddy, you can pitch here, but you can't play shortstop here or something. Does that happen to you a lot, Coach? It Not a lot, but I have done that. I mean, I can think of three guys right off the top of my head that were, they would throw for me like on a Tuesday or a Friday, whatever. And it, if he wasn't thrown for me, I'd let him go down and hit. I said, okay, he's going to either DH or he's going to play first base because he's not going to play shortstop, you know. But if you want to swing, and, and I, I wouldn't limit them. I mean, if, if they wanted to do that and embrace that, you know. But after a while, all three of them just said, 
we're just going to stay at the varsity and be a PO. And they, they didn't like bouncing yeah. back and forth. And, and it chooses, it, 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 it affects the dynamic of the team, too, because all of a sudden you got your sophomore team's playing, and all of a sudden this guy shows up and he's betting third or fourth and hasn't seen him because he's without the varsity the whole time, you know. And it just, it, it, sometimes it's, it's kind of tough. You know, and, and then they know each other, and, and if, if he's if he's well liked, no problem. If he, they don't like him, they got problems. <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> Why is this guy taking my spot? Right, right. <laughs> it, and that's where a, a a coach comes into play. Um, you know, and those are tough decisions. And you know, if if you have a coach that. Uh, you know, has been around it a while and, and, and seen a lot of different levels of baseball and can kind of weed out, hey, yes, he, he is hitting, you know, 468 on the freshman team, but I can tell, you know, I can tell he's probably not going to be that guy for beyond high school, but he probably is that guy on the mound. That's where a guy like Coach Perkins, you know, you're – if you're blessed with a coach like that, then he's going to be able to see that and get that kid in the position for long-term success, not just success on his freshman or JV baseball team. Because that's, although I know you're trying to win games at that level, the ultimate goal is development. Am yeah. I right, coach? Yeah, you're you're exactly right. And, and I think the biggest key to this that people lose track of, okay, you want them, they should be playing varsity. Okay, so you're playing against pitchers that are, you know, two, three years older than you. You know, if you're 15, 16, you're going up against an 18 year old, that's significant. You, you need to be special. I mean, I mean, yeah, you could hit 460 at a freshman level, but if you all of a sudden you jump up and get against these guys at the varsity level, it's a different world. I mean, the velo's way up there and you're seeing breaking pitches, you're seeing guys pitching backwards and it's like, whoa, come back with the big eyes. Like, uh oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> it's a big deal. It's tough. And and Kevin, you see this, uh, you know, we're talking about these guys, uh, this young man uh, from Fort Zumwalt West, uh, Nolan Sissom, um, got a chance to start as a freshman. He was in that leadoff spot at the end of that season and really was a catalyst offensively for that team. Um, that just doesn't happen very often, does it? No. No, but. not at a school like that. Um, you'll see that we talk about this as we head into the state championships and the playoffs. You'll see that like when we get get down there to Springfield, you'll see a freshman or sophomore playing at one of the one, two, three, four A's. It's extremely rare at, at, at a top 10 level in maybe I'm being maybe top five level school at 6A to see a freshman starting at a premium position like that that's yeah it, it is a tough player. and that being said i've had two of them and I, i've two of my team <laughs> this year i mean titus Sissel started as a freshman and started mm -hmm. up for he'll start for four years and then you got leo humbert who's leo humbert i mean he's started with me as a freshman before them two cats hit the scene uh, we had only three guys in my career that were four-year starters for me which yeah that's going 30 years. Right, right. <laughs> you know, so it doesn't happen very often. There's got to be a need. And when you has got to fit in. in. Yeah. You know, and when you see a kid, when that happens, you're almost sure to have a power five type player on your team. All those kids that coaches, now Leo's not committed yet, but he could be if he wanted to be. And I know he's sifting through plenty of big time offers and Titus yes. is, of course, committed to Mizzou and, and Nolan, Nolan system is committed to Missouri as well. So if you get one of those, you're dealing with someone that uh, your your phone lines are going to be burning up a little bit from college coaches. Yeah. Right. System in a bet in like third form at the end of the year. Was it third? I thought it was. Yeah. yeah. He was, he led off early and then all of a sudden That's he's what in, it was. in yeah. the, where you put your best hitter. <laughs> so that, that tells you the freshman. And, and man, watching him special play. Special dude. Watching him play defense, I you know, you always look and see, I understand, you know, the bat, I know it's hard to hit at the varsity level, but to me the the telltale sign is you hang you hang throughout the whole season and you can stay defensively uh focused 
throughout the season, making plays, continuing to be uh, as a freshman playing shortstop in the GAC Class 6, and uh, they were what? 31 and 6 or something like that and uh your 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 best player is a freshman that gives a lot of credence to the to his ability mentally to uh take on that role it's and pretty, you don't see pretty, that much pretty in a kid nice like for that. Uh, coach golf you can just pencil that shortstop and three hole for four years that's a pretty good deal <laughs> makes, it, makes it's life pretty easier remarkable. <laughs> it, it's pretty remarkable if you think about it, because not only are you playing varsity baseball and, and Coach Josh on Sissel and Humbert, you're facing dudes. You, I, I'll take the top two from all, like, uh, you know, if you're facing Hal, uh, you're facing guys that are going on to Division One baseball, Landon Shipway going to, to SLU, um, you know, Alex Bryan going to Maryville, um, it, it just doesn't stop. Hal Central, Ruble going to Maryville. Um, you know, Timberland had Hatchman thrown in the upper 90s and uh, Yarberry going to SLU. You're facing not just varsity pitchers. You're facing dudes that are going to be in college baseball the next year, and you're a 14-year-old or 15-year-old trying to play varsity baseball. Yeah, that's, impressive. that's what I do. Early in the season, I do my scrimmages. I don't do jamborees. Um, I just feel like I can get more accomplished with our team. And I'll bring the young ones up that, I, that are on the radar, you know, and, th and just like what Kevin was just saying, you know, I got enough arms where I can get them to where I need to get them as far as pitch counts and stuff like that. But, you know, like I, I got the arms, but I also got the hitters. So competition wise, it's pretty rough. In my yeah. place, I mean, because they're going at it, and, <laughs> right. and 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 it's making us better. I mean, the pitcher's got a pitch, and the hitter's got a hit, you know. So, I mean, it's it's fun to watch, you know. And I'll even get some umpires out there sometimes to knock the rust off, and and you know, work out with us and stuff. But it, it's it's really tough deal when you get okay. I I need a second baseman today, you know. So I'll take sophomore second baseman and throw him out there, you know, and so see how he does. He gets a couple of hits. You know, he may not be on a sophomore team no more. You know, that's right. how it works. <laughs> you know, whoever's hottest and whoever's doing the best is going to get time on the field. Opportunity, right? Yeah. I give him shots. That's all right. I think that's great. The other one around here uh, we've talked about, uh, started as a freshman last year, sophomore uh, Brendan Pyle from Zumwalt East. Um, you know, we've talked about him a, a little bit. And uh, he finally he started at third base, but moved to shortstop in the middle of the season. Uh, he hit well. If what do you see with him in this? He's uh, he's he's not committed yet as well. And at this point, they won't be able to commit, will they, Kevin? If they haven't now, committed, Brennan, Brennan was committed to Missouri um, and then decommitted. Um, you know, he, he's a special player. He has a lot of same traits as Sissom. Um, you know, and I, I saw that, you know, at the beginning of the year, he started out at third and they moved him over to the short. And typically, and maybe coach can speak on this, when you do get a young guy, if you're going to play him on varsity, he's going to play, but then you're also trying to probably protect him and put him in a, a good position to succeed. Coach, when you get a young guy up on the varsity, is it, it, and it, it, it is interesting because I talked to the Zumwalt West guys and, and they started system at shortstop from day one, which is pretty bold and aggressive. It means they knew that he was going to be able to handle it. Um, but talk about when you call a guy up to the varsity, how important is it for him to have some success and just the dynamics between having a freshman play with the older kids and how, how do you go about that, navigating that as a coach? Yeah, that's – tough there's got to be a need and he's got to be good enough I mean if we're shy a second baseman we're shy an outfielder something like that if he can compete yeah let's bring him on now if the kid comes in thinking he's really good it usually doesn't work <laughs> I mean if they come in you know and like Leo Leo Humbert and Ty Sissel when they come up as freshmen didn't say a word they approached it the right way. They just shut their mouths and got out there and did something. 
But what I also do, and I've done this before, is talk to my leader senior, say, hey, man, he's going to be on our team. Take him under your wing. Protect him. Don't let any nonsense happen. Don't let anybody pick on him. I mean, yeah, there's going to be ribbon. That's part of the game. I mean, that's part mm -hmm. of baseball. That's what goes on all the time. But protect him, and that's going to be your job. And, and I'm going to be watching and you know, help us out here because he can help us, and I think you understand it. He's good enough to play at the varsity level, you know, and if he's worrying about what people think about him and worrying about other things besides baseball, he's, he's going to fail, and we don't want him to fail. I mean, we want him to do well. If he fails enough, he's going to get – you know, ship back down. I've done that two, three times as well. As I've had them up and gave them, gave them a week or two, and it wasn't working. So I just shipped them back down so they can get their at, at bats in and their time there. But you, you're right, Kevin. It, it, it is. It's a tough thing, um, but you need to have everybody on the same page. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I have a talk with the whole team about it. It's like, okay, you know, uh, Leo Humbert's going to be on our team, and everybody's like, duh. <laughs> you know, that's just, that was just kind of a, a Good stupid job, thing to coach. say. But, yeah, we all understood that. When I, after the first day of BP, when he hit like four home runs, I'm like, wow. <laughs> but, but, yeah, but you have to talk to everybody. Get everybody on the same page. It's like, you know, you're not going to play center field because Leo but, Humbert's going to be there. You're not going to play shortstop because Ty Sissel's there. I mean, you know, what's left? You know, you got to look around and – Maybe you need to play a different position. You know, like Sissom, he may not be a shortstop in college. He might be a second baseman, you know. Who knows? Right. A lot of the kids that I send to college end up playing different positions anyway. I mean, I bet, but I 75, 80 percent of my kids that go to different colleges play different positions, which is great. They're playing, getting on the field. And I think that's the key. You know, as you said, Kevin, and you're talking about this, Coach, will, they, will that player accept whatever role he's given? You know, you have to you have to buy into that. I mean, as you said, Titus came up, was playing what left field, mm -hmm. right? As a freshman, you know, he was a short. But you're not playing in front of Jake McCutcheon. Mm -mm. You know, if you if you can help us as a as a as a freshman, fantastic. But it's going to have to be where we need the help. Correct. Yeah, and like that that kid in particular, I mean, he's so multifaceted. You know, he can play all yeah. three outfield spots. He can play all three, probably, probably play all four if he wanted to. He, heck, he's 6'2 now. He's dunking the basketball. Know. He's just working Whoa. his tail off. Yeah, <laughs> it's unbelievable. He's made a jump, man. It's something else. You know, but having those kids able to play those other positions is huge, you yeah. know. Yeah. And, and like, I think even on when I was here, we were talking about him when he was younger. It's like, is Titus going to – slide in the shortstop when Jake leaves and that's what happened you know yeah I, I didn't know that was going to happen but it did happen it was great and he got recruited as a shortstop mm -hmm. as in college you know but he's a really great outfielder yes because he <laughs> he's so fast you know go I, ahead give I give this talk at a lot of my events um and it to me especially for young players because they they haven't seen this yet they're they're used to being the best, you know, if they're a guy, hey, I'm going to play shortstop or I'm a center fielder or I'm the whatever position and I bat third or I bat lead off. Um, okay, if, the, if that's your stance, what these kids don't understand is there's going to be multiple times in their careers when they're going to run into roadblocks. And if they're not willing to play or able to play another position, they're really uh, hurting their chances of on the field. I'll start with the freshman in high school. Well, if Tessel was so, you know, hellbent on being a shortstop, and that's the only thing I can do, coach, then he wouldn't have played varsity baseball as a freshman because Jake McCutcheon was there. And he was a, showed the ability to play the outfield. Uh, I saw, remember him playing second base. And, and this mm -hmm. isn't about Titus specifically. This is just a general conversation. So I always tell kids, I'm like, well, you could be the second best player at your position in the whole state. You're the second best shortstop in the state. And uh, if Coach Perkins is your coach and you're the second best player in the state at your position and he gets a kid that moves in from California and now he's the best player in the state, I know who Coach Perkins is going to play at that position. <laughs> he's going to play the kid that's better, the one that gives him the better chance. Yes, so you sir. better know how to do something else. <laughs> and then you carry that conversation further. Okay, you're the man. You're the shortstop and you were all world and all state at, you know, all state Missouri and you were the PBR player of the year and everything is great. 
now you've gotten to college. And you're that, let's say you're over at Mizzou or Missouri State or SLU. And uh, now they got a 21 year old that's a two time all conference performer at that at your position. Good luck unseating him as a 18 or 19 year old kid playing in a man's game. You're going to now have to learn how to play left field or second base or what if you want to get into that lineup as a freshman. So, and then you take it a, further, a step further, bring up Jordan Walker. Kid was a, a, one of the best third basemen in the country. Uh, extremely high draft pick, and, uh, you know, by the Cardinals. Uh, he, he's trying to make the big leagues. Well, there's a guy named Nolan Arenado playing third base, probably the best third baseman <laughs> in the game of baseball. Position. <laughs> Jordan Walker's either going to have to wait, you know, eight more years for Nolan to retire, <laughs> or he's going to have to learn to play a new position. And that, that guy's getting paid millions of dollars. Well, he got signed for millions of dollars and is, you know, making a ton of money. It's a career thing for him. Uh, you know, I'll bring up Tommy Edmond. Uh, starting shortstop at Stanford University. That's as, about as big time as it gets. You know, he cracks in and wins a gold glove at second base. Then he gets to go to play shortstop, and now he's in center field again. So it's mm-hmm. – versatility is a beautiful thing. If you want to advance in the game of baseball, you need to be able to play multiple positions. Certainly there's exceptions to the rule, uh, you know, catchers, uh, pitching, um but a rule of thumb, the more positions you can play, the more things you're willing to do, the better opportunity you have to advance in the game and to be in the lineup, quite honestly, whether that's gotta, freshman, I, baseball, sophomore, et cetera. I got to bring up Nate Orr, 2008 grad for us. Great player, great kid. Was that my catcher? You know, um, He ends up at Baylor, uh, plays outfield, second base, gets hooks up with the Brewers, makes it to the big leagues as a second baseman and was a catcher in high school. You know, but – an athlete that could run, you know, and mm-hmm. just he saw the positions that was up open and, and went for those positions. And in the minor leagues, he played all nine positions in one game and then coached first base. <laughs> I mean, pretty special, <laughs> pretty special dude. <laughs> he did. <laughs> he did. So that, that's good stuff. But yeah, it's it's unbelievable. I also wanted to talk about Brett Graves at you know 2011 group. People don't realize when he left Francis Howell High School, he was our leading hits leader in history of our game. He never had one at bat at Mizzou and ends mm-hmm. up being the big leagues too, so as a pitcher, so. Well, I, I, I said this to these gentlemen, I, I ran into Chase Krogman. Uh, he's with the White Sox organization. He's been a left-hand hitter, whatnot. Well, wasn't going, he's had a lot of injuries. It wasn't working. He's changed over, he's becoming a pitcher, uh, left-handed, left-handed arm and you know how that goes in the major leagues and especially if you can pump a little gas on uh, on the left side so he's still working to get his opportunity there it, it I think the the interesting thing and in what we're talking about here folks is these players here when you look at this top 10 these are some serious athletes are they not these yeah I would are say kids so. that are very athletic um and their opportunities and, and getting that athleticism and being able to do multiple things and just using your athleticism as a baseball player is key for your success, right? Yeah, I'm just looking at the top 10 here, and uh, we got two quarterbacks on the list minimally that I know about. Uh, Caden Th- Thronberry at Marquette High School is a QB. Um, Rocco Marriott over at Platte County. His dad was an NFL tight end for the St. Louis Rams, Jeff Marriott. Um, and Rocco is a quarterback at, at Platte County and is equally probably as good at quarterback as he is baseball. And he, you know, I don't know. He's, he's a center fielder. He's a pitcher and he's a quarterback. And your guess is as good as mine is what he's going to do when he moves on. But he's going to do something good. Um, <laughs> it, it's just He'll have he'll come to the fork in the road and he's going to have to take it as Yogi Berra says. <laughs> yeah, you got one of those kids, uh, state championship quarterback, Adam Shipley. P- Adam Shipley. But he's um, committed to play baseball at SLU. There you go. Pitch. But that's at, you seeing the athleticism there. Yeah, he's pretty athletic. Right. <laughs> yeah. And and I think that's the interesting thing. You see these kids, and if you go down the list, you know, you said um, Ray Peck. 
first baseman Johnny Carver, uh, Grant Murhoff. I guess that's how you pronounce it. Is that correct? Yeah, Merhoff. And, and Carver, just to go back on Johnny Carver to the number seven, um, and again, the, the kids put the, you know, I get some heat during the rankings. People get caught up in where they're ranked positionally. <laughs> that's what Johnny calls himself, a first baseman. He listed that. He is a left-handed pitcher um, who is committed to Arkansas. So he, he will not play first base for the Razorbacks. He will be a left-handed pitcher. Um <laughs> for them but you know he's a good high school first baseman and um yeah and then grant murhoff uh that's a an already a mid-80s left-hander up to 86 or 7 and uh committed to louisville mercy 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 and you go on down it doesn't get any different we saw gt taylor last year over at cbc good athlete um as well aiden hyde He's playing over at Lutheran St. Charles, going to Xavier, which you look at Xavier, what kind of school that is. That's an academic school. That's that's very much like that. And this young man, I've seen him since he was 13. He's been big. He's athletic. I, I don't know if he cut his hair yet so his hat stays on. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> kind of remind me of Adam, you know, watching last year, hat come to the ground. You know, get some staples or something, you know. I'm kidding. But uh, you look at these guys. These are all tremendous athletes. Drew Messi um, as well over at Westminster Christian. These kids are all very athletic, and I think that's what has changed maybe in baseball over the last maybe 20 years, the athleticism that you see uh, in the sport, I think, has has grown. Thoughts? People are getting very good at training these athletes, and people are getting serious about it. Um, So, yes, uh, you know, I I, I do think that that's always been there um, back in, you know, back in the day, we'll say, you know, the the best athlete was going to be the quarterback. um, He's going to be the basketball player, and he's going to play shortstop on the baseball team. And you would see that kid do all three you're not seeing that as much uh, today anymore. Uh, you will see some two-sport guys, the three-sport guys getting getting tough, especially at the 6A school. Um, but there is a lot of athleticism in, in that top of the at that top of the group there. Yeah, I think it's almost a shame. I mean that, especially if they specialize earlier in their career, you know, and say, all I'm going to do is play baseball when, you know, I, I always try to tell kids, play other sports. I mean, I, I think that it's great to get away from the game for a few months and you're still competing. You're, mm-hmm. you're still staying in shape. You know, you, yeah, you may go hit in the evening times after practice or you do whatever you got to do baseball wise, but it's good to get away from baseball for a while, I think. And, and, and I think if they can play sports, you know, there's other sports, it's, it's, good for everybody. It's good for the family. It's good for the kids. It's good for the schools, good for the coaches. You know, I mean, you know, you look at my four sons. I mean, three of them played two sports all the way through and the one that got drafted played three sports all the way through, you know, you know, for four years, which, and and Kevin mentioned that earlier. I mean, you don't see that very often anymore. Right. And before you'd always see it. I mean, even if you didn't start, you were on the team, you know, and you know, you're on the basketball team, you're on the football team or whatever, but, you know, uh, and that's kind of a shame. But to attest what you were saying, that's why we got these athletes and these arms that are throwing mid-80s, high-80s, or whatever they're doing at that at this age that we're talking about because they have specialized and they are doing a training, like Kevin mentioned earlier, with all the people, the trainers that are out there, you know, and, and they stay with these programs and they lift and do what they're supposed to do, you know, arm care and whatever else. Yeah, it's got to be, it's going to make them good, no doubt. But you're putting all your eggs in one basket, too. I mean, who knows? Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> Kevin, uh, some other kit. Oh, go ahead. You were going to, sorry. No, I was just going to make mention, you know, we talk about this top 10 list, and here's one thing I will guarantee that won't look like that when they're seniors. They're, I, you know, 
it's a blessing and a curse to be recognized um, because now these kids are all expected to be that guy. And, um, you know, Coach Perkins has a couple of these kids on their team, on his team, and typically does. Um, th- those kids have some pressure. And they, you know, now when they go play an opponent, it's, oh, so and so is committed to big school U and he's ranked wherever. Um, and then he has a rough outing. And oh, he's overrated, or he yeah. he can't yeah, you, play. You, you hear um, that in the stands quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. So those kids have the target, so they got to be mentally tough enough, and they have to continue to work. Their work is really just beginning. If they stop, if they're happy, if they think they've made it because they're told they're so good by a you know PBR or PG or whatever, or they're committed to a certain school. Coach has seen this a million, uh, plenty of times. That's not where they'll end up if they quit working. Um, these kids are good enough to go play at that college today. Um, it's they got to keep going. They're on the right track. They're heading the right direction. But if you put any of the ten, uh, any of these ten in the top ten at their school where they're committed to right now. They, they wouldn't make the travel roster. They'd be cut immediately. They're not good enough, nor should they be. Um, but yeah, they're also 15, saying 16 it, years old, right? Yeah. If you're outside the top 100 or you're not ranked, I guarantee there will be a kid that gets to go to Division One baseball or becomes a draft pick uh, that we don't even know their name right now in this state, in this class. It, it will happen. Um, the there's develop weight developers, kids that, you know, it kind of lights a fire under. They, they're driven by the fact that they're overlooked. That happens all the time. And and I think that's why it's tough sometimes. I know we talk, we bring this on. We're talking about uh, we have conversation. I like the conversation more. We're 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 throwing in kids' names, especially at the top. But the conversation about this, and and I hope that's what people take away, what these two gentlemen are saying about this information. This is what you do for a living, and yet you understand the dynamics of it and hopefully helping these kids understand the dynamics of this. Fantastic. Yeah, you're, you're, you're looking really good right now. Your measurables are really good. But if you don't continue to work, you're going to come back next year and all these guys that were below you, they're working and you're not, are going to jump right over you. Kev, what do you it, think? It's about? no different than me telling Coach Perkins, uh, and there's a couple polls, hey, Coach P, you're, uh, you're in preseason number one it, uh, <laughs> next year. What does that mean to you? I don't like it. <laughs> not one bit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not so one he bit. knows. <laughs> I'd rather be you know, he knows eight, what nine, that ten. Does to him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, it, I, there's I, so much a, work. It's the done. kiss of death. I mean, there's yeah. been many times I've been ranked number one in preseason, don't even get to the final four. I mean, it's a kiss of death, man. <laughs> But then you look at it through the prism, hey, Coach P, you're not a top 10 team. You're, you know, like you're ranked 11th. Now, I like, like, I like there's that. There's a chip on the shoulder, <laughs> yeah, right? I like that. Yes. That is yeah. exactly right. Now we want to get to that number one spot. We want to be number one at the end of the year. I mean, that's the goal. Right. Yeah. And hey, it should be, right? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Kev, I was going to ask you this question. Um, you got all these kids committed at this age. How many do you think will end up going to those schools? Mm good question so that that's a great question in the landscape as you know has changed so much first right. off um these kids are like the last there's like one or two in the 27 class um the rule has changed as both you know uh so now schools in my opinion and this is a phenomenal rule cannot talk to our athletes until they are heading into their junior year. So August 1st of their junior year. Um, but these players were already committed, so their commitments are honored. Um, it is hard to say, but I do I do like to say this to anyone going through the recruiting process. Um, you should always watch the classes above you. One thing about these, these lists, these rankings, uh, if you look at history before you um, that can help you in your future, um, 
kind of see where you fit in and what happened to those players that went to the schools um, on their on their commitment list, um, or are they still there two years yeah, later? There you go. Um, As I was just going to say, is the coach still there? I mean, is the coach still there? So things change, you know, so much. And, and the the other thing that's happened with the transfer portal. Um, and part of it was during the COVID, we had all the COVID, the extra year, the fifth year, sixth year guys, et cetera. Um, but the high school player has gotten squeezed a little bit. Um, uh, a kid that um, used to be going to a, a pretty nice Division One is now choosing between a D2 school, a good D2 or a JUCO. Um, because the college coach can now go pick up a kid that has 500 at bats and a proven track record and you know from a division two program or from a different division one program and um so the the landscape in uh, high school recruiting has changed significantly and you know coach peace had a first-hand look at this as well um yep. it, is, it is it is evolving and has evolved extremely quickly even over the past handful of years don't you think? i think it's starting to iron out just a little bit because of the fifth year guys you mentioned earlier. I mean, you're not going to see that as much because things are getting better after the COVID yes. year. You know, I think that it's catching up with them right now. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like Carbondale, I know that they don't recruit any high school kids, zero. I mean, and they're not the only one in the country who does that. I mean, every kid they go get is somebody from the portal or a JUCO guy. Every one of them. They, they, they don't even mess with them. Because they don't want an 18-year-old, they want a 21-year-old that can jump in there and start right away. It's got some experience and got some college ABs where where they don't want to have the time, you know, just give the kid two or three years as an 18-year-old, you know, to be good enough to help them. So that they just don't mess with high school kids, which that that that's bothersome. That that hurts. But hey, I get it. That's they're trying yeah. to be the best they can do, and they do pretty well. They're they're going with the more of a sure thing, and it's the same approach as like the big leagues drafting MLB. You see a higher percentage of college kids drafting, and, and the reason is it's more of a sure thing. It, it's it's a less risky proposition that when you get a guy when he's 21, uh, he has more of a track record versus known competition. Um, it's a percentage play, and, and the same thing there by the Division ones are kind of following suit. It makes sense. It, it, it makes sense. You understand, as you said, you know, you may not like it, but you understand. And when you got a college coach on that side of it, that's making decisions about his livelihood, you know, and winning is, we can say we want to, it's still about winning at those levels. Mm -hmm. And you don't have a job, you know, if you don't have success. So what are you doing to create the opportunities for that success? And these are all the things that go into it. It's just the reality of it. Yep. Kevin, I know we got to get you out of here. Uh, uh, so thank you very much. Appreciate you joining. As always, you know, being part of this. I know we didn't get into a lot of the kids, but we'll do that. And I'll throw – what I'll do is I'll make sure there's a um, link in the description – you can go down, check it out, to click to and get if you can see the rankings. I don't know if you've got a membership. You can see the rankings. If you don't, I don't think you can, right, on the PBR? Uh, no. There you go. But we can, we can go through them again another time if you'd like. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about these kids as we move through because we've got some good stuff coming up. We'll get Coach P back. Um, we got uh, some – we got them lining up, talking some high school baseball over the next few weeks with – Coach Roach from down in Jackson, Coach Stiegel over there at Liberty North, Coach uh, McGee down in uh, uh, Willard. So every, we're, we're going to talk a lot of baseball over the next little bit through this offseason. Going to have some fun. I think it's going to be a very interesting conversation you don't want to miss. Just what, Coach, you were talking about there at the end, uh, you know, and dealing with these things as a high school coach, how many parents understand this process? What's going on in the landscape of baseball right now, right? Mm -hmm. It's tough. I, I've had a lot of parents come and ask if they could come to my house and talk about the recruiting thing, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I mean, I think that was a wise move by that family. And and just ha happened with 
couple of Leo's parents as well, but the kid didn't even come. Parents just came in and wanted to, which I thought was very merited, and I've been through it, and I could steer them hopefully right. in the right direction. <laughs> Who knows? It's a, and, yeah. and Kevin, we're going to have this conversation because Coach and I were talking about it when he came in, but I think the next the big thing to discuss is the NIL money. I mean, that's going to have a huge impact on what's coming down the line, and, and we're, we're going to have to have that conversation. I think it'll be an interesting conversation. It'll definitely be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, but I want to do a little – because I don't know enough about it personally. I want to do a little more research. I know you guys are looking at it. But I want to know a little bit more about what it is and what, you know, what's going on with this and bringing this to the table and maybe we get a few more coaches involved. And because this is when you start putting money like this into it, um, it it changes the dynamics of things. It just does. It's Uh, economics. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, guys, as always, appreciate your time. Appreciate you dropping the knowledge. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. If you've uh, watching for the first time, hit the subscribe button. Hit the dinger next to it because that's what we do. Always good to hit a bomb, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, that gets you all your upcoming notifications for episodes uh, next week, week after. We're going to have a lot of fun doing this. Also, too, just an FYI, if you're, if you're a dad coach, I'm talking to these guys. We're working on getting, to get, getting a coach's clinic for dad coaches, uh, youth dad coaches. Um, we're working on that. We already have one venue set up. We're going to get some information for that um, coming up in December. Um, we want to help these young dad coaches go out and be successful, understand what they're dealing with. I think it's a great opportunity to, to learn how to develop practice plans, what, what it means to coach at that level, keeping it fun, keeping it real, but yet developing these kids. I think that's a, a – so we're going to be doing that as well. So I want to let you know about that coming up. Everybody, have a great day in the Lord. All you pitchers, Kevin. Keep throwing strikes. Hitters. Coach. Hit them where they ain't. See, look at that. It's great advice all around. <laughs> we'll see y'all next time.